guys welcome again welcome to my youtube channel my name is roland you don't know me and if this is the first time on my channel i would like to say thank you for watching this conversation i'm about to have with ian wilson by the way i am on youtube living out my passion which is helping you experience the ultimate benefits to remembering who and why you are and i believe that we are these infinite beings having a temporary an illusionary experience here on earth designed to teach us all how to be infinitely creative experience and express an infinite array of emotions as well basically we are information gatherers we gather the information we use it to create more information which we gather and the cycle goes on and if you notice one thing i said is we're having an illusionary and temporary experience here on earth doing this work and today I'm really excited, very, very excited to have my next guest, Ian Wilson, coming to me or talking to us live this evening from Canada. Um, Ian Wilson is a fellow who has been lucid dreaming consistently for over 30 years now. He has written and created extensive content on the topic. You can find him on Twitter at You Are Dreaming. He also has a YouTube channel that you can learn a lot about lucid dreaming and different types of dreaming. Um, he's documented a lot of his lucid dream experiences as well. And all of this, besides being hosted on his YouTube channel, are also available on his website, youaredreaming.org. So yeah, Ian, thank you for being on the show. How are you doing, my friend? I'm doing fabulous, Roland, and thank you once again for having me on as a guest. Man, it's my pleasure. It really is my pleasure. So um, dreaming has always been fascinating to me. Um, when I started meditating, one of the crazy experiences I had was being aware that I was dreaming at night when I was sleeping and then also slowly learning to affect the dream that I was having, consciously affect the dream that I was having. And I thought that that was the most, one of the most bizarre experiences I had. And then waking up to this reality shed a whole new light for me on what um, dreams can be how beneficial they can be and then um and, and lucid dreaming as well so i'm hoping that you can answer some of the questions that i have some of the questions that the viewers are going to have about this um during the show well i'm sure i can i have like i said a tremendous amount of knowledge and experience being conscious during sleep indeed um, Ian, if you want to take us back to the beginning, if you don't mind, just how did you get into lucid dreaming and what was your experience like? I was pretty young, 15 years old, and I was already having a lot of fun dreams. I was kind of that kid who'd watch a TV show and I always wanted to be a character in those types of worlds. And I would notice my dreams would then sometimes take on the characteristics of like cartoons and TV shows that I liked. But I wasn't lucid and I came across an article written by Dr. Stephen LeBurge in an Omni magazine called Power Trips, Controlling Your Dreams, where he discussed the idea of being conscious when you're actually in a dream. And I thought that was an amazing idea. Like, dreams are already pretty fun, and I couldn't imagine what it would be like to actually be awake in the dream and experience the full richness of it. So it didn't really give any techniques, but just the idea that it planted was so powerful that within about 48 hours, I would be in a dream, and suddenly for the first time, I would come into realizing that that's what that was. And when I was in that focus state, the realism was just as real as waking life. So it was my first taste of what I would now call a second life experience. And uh, it was everything I thought it would be. It was fun. I ended up flying, had a really great time. And then I ended up, which is the inevitability of dreaming, is that they're temporary and you have to wake up eventually. And of course, you wake up and go, wow, now that was something very cool. So from an entertainment perspective in the beginning, I thought, I'm going to do this as much as I can because what else are you going to do when you sleep at night? A lot of people go to bed and they lose 30% of your conscious opportunity to unconscious sleep. So, you know, it instead of taking away an opportunity to be conscious, you now gain that. So you gain conscious experience. So it was a no-brainer to me. I was like, well, I'm actually adding conscious experience to myself in this second life, this second focus state. And uh, it became quite easy to do. And as I started to grow into that experience, 
more and more profound things started to emerge that Stephen Lebert didn't write about that definitely fueled my interest that, hey, dreams are more than just dreams. They're, they're more than just a fantasy state. They actually have a relationship to our waking life that can come through. And a lot of people can encounter that when they have deja vu. And I'm sure a lot of us have had deja vu where we link the memory and the familiarity of that deja moment to something we dreamed about days, weeks, months, years in the past. And that started to bubble up in my dream experiences. And of course, when the first time that happened, I was terrified. But as I began to explore that experience and learn from it, it was probably one of the most profound teachers that I could encounter because it directly related to my waking life through the dream state. And I found that to be just absolutely the most amazing thing, in addition to many other epiphanies that can come with participating in yourself consciously during sleep. Man, no, that was a lot of information. Thank you for sharing, by the way. Certainly a lot to unpack. Um, but the, if you don't mind me going back to the beginning before we even focus on, on the benefits, on how lucid dreaming or being conscious during um, sleep and being aware that you're dreaming can provide a lot of benefits to your earth life, essentially, is, you know, you said 15 years old when you began this, did you teach yourself the techniques that you learned or how... How did you go? You talked about 48 hours, I believe, from when you became aware of this to actually having your first lucid dream. And if I'm misunderstanding that. I apologize. But how did you? Is this all self-taught? It is. Um, I just started becoming aware <clears throat> and curious as my body would fall asleep and pay attention to the shift into the dream state. And so instead of trying to shut myself down like we normally do by thinking or tricking ourselves into this belief system that we have to be asleep when our body's asleep, and that's kind of a belief that we all have taught, but I consider that to be a bad habit, um, I started observing the shift and studying, okay, what's happening as my body falls asleep and my mind starts to observe dream information. And through that, I kind of came up with this awareness that it's like our senses invert. Right now, we're sensing the objective world. When we go to sleep, our senses invert. So our sense of sight, um, touch, taste, smell will invert to start sensing the dream state. So I call it the inversion of the senses. So I noticed a sensory shift into the dream state at first. And um, by just working with that naturally occurring process and remaining conscious for it, um, just allowed me to walk right into a dream almost every time. So it came quite naturally just by just being aware of what's already there mechanically in us and observing those processes and just with the one intention of remaining conscious. Okay. So um, it sounds like you had an intention, right? That was kind of the driving force behind this saying, I want to pay attention to the way I'm falling asleep with the goal of actually being awake while my body was asleep. That's exactly right. Okay. Did you use any... Um, um, sounds any binaural beats or anything else no i wasn't even aware of those things until much later on so it was all very natural and even when i teach dreaming now i talk about your own natural processes of falling asleep and not to change them or interrupt them but work with them because it just makes it more effective um, than trying to create a whole system that may keep you awake or keep your focus somewhere else indeed now, what about dieting or eating? I mean, sleep habits. Were there any prescriptive sleep habits that you developed? Or was it basically you would run through your day normally and then just go to bed and pay attention with the intention of um, being awake while you're sleeping? Well, when I was very invested into it because I was having such a blast, I did sleep a lot more than eight hours. And I okay. did find that sleeping for a short period of time, maybe four to six hours, and then waking up and then going back to bed made it a lot easier to maintain consciousness. So I've worked very well with what they call the um, wake back to bed method is what people in dream talk talk about. So the wake back to bed has been very effective for me. Um, although I find I can lucid dream between both cycles. So, um, you know, it's not entirely necessary. The real key is, is how you manage your thoughts and your focus as you fall asleep. So if you let your mind get full of all your daily anxieties, all your problems, all your concerns, and your head gets very unfocused, it can make it hard to move into the dream state. But if you learn to 
and meditation is, I guess, a good way of saying calm your thoughts down so that there's no noise. When you calm the noise down, everything starts to flow naturally. So um, turning off all of your anxiety, setting all that stuff aside and clearing the slate for a very clear perception. Move into sleep is what I've done. Okay. So the, the two things you mentioned that I find very fascinating, um, and I can relate to this from my personal experience. Um, the first was the latter that you mentioned, which is meditation. And I got into lucid dreaming. I even became aware of this as a result of my meditating practices before going to bed. But the, the former, which you mentioned, was the wake to sleep cycle, right? And that I found to actually, I, I never called it wake to sleep. I just, I didn't have a name for it. I just knew if I fell asleep and then woke up about between 1 and 3 a.m., and meditated before going back to bed again and you know fell asleep while meditating then i was way more consciously aware of my sleep and the dreams that i would have now is that what you're kind of similar to what you're referring to absolutely uh, it's um i feel it's because your body does need a certain amount of rest so you kind of get that initial rest in your pre-sleep before you go into the second sleep to do the dreaming and what I find is that the body still needs sleep, but the mind's kind of now active and doesn't really. So the body can fall asleep a lot quicker now. And I find that's what makes it so much easier is the body will now relax much quicker, move faster into sleep. And the mind can then focus its intention on being conscious. And those shifts can happen quite rapidly and uh, move into that other focus state. That See, that makes sense to me. And honestly, it's been my experience. I've always... Um, of, always just had a more conscious awakened sleep experience the second time I fall asleep so after 2 a.m. and if I meditate then I know something just insanely amazing is going to happen um, yeah and I find too like I get myself right out of bed it's a great opportunity to use the washroom so that you don't have to be interrupted by a full bladder that's always a pain in the butt especially if you're having an amazing experience next thing you know because that state is temporary, it's fickle, and any kind of physical response will pull you out of it. And trust me, I've tried to fight waking up many times in dreams, sometimes I'm successful, but most of the time the body always wins. And so that's a nice thing for people who might be scared of dreaming is the worst thing that'll ever happen to you in a dream is you wake up. So it's not something to bring fear into. <laughs> no kidding. So <laughs> I'm laughing because um, like, this is really personal, and I'm not afraid to share this. I was a bedwetter for, I mean, like, probably the first quarter of my life, or first half of my life, I wet the bed right up until I was 15 or 16. And even up to today, I wake up every evening, at least once or twice, to use the restroom. And that has always been an interrupter of my dream. So I find that very funny that you mentioned that, because that's really, really my personal experience, is <laughs> having to get up. Um, come back to my body and go uh, go to the bathroom and relieve myself. But Absolutely. enough of that. Yeah. It does it for all of us. I mean, we're human and we have a body and the body has biological processes. And the other thing too is, you know, if you are going to have anything to drink when you wake up in that little period of time, no more than half a cup of water. And it's again, you just try to make sure that you're in a state where everything is in your control and not being kind of pulled in the other direction. So it's just, and it's such a simple and easy thing do to get into the habit of participating in your already existing five to six dreams a night. It's everybody's dream. There's not a person that doesn't go to sleep that isn't part of the dreaming process. Not everybody's consciously participating in it, and that's the difference in that choice. Indeed. Man, and with other senses, you talked about the sensory shift or paying attention to that um, right when you're you know, falling asleep. Can you talk about that a little bit more? What are some senses that we could be aware of while we are falling asleep? Yeah, it's a pretty interesting process because we go through this state called hypnagogia, and that's what they call it, and that's your pre-sleep. And in, in one way of looking at it, it's almost like we're dialing in a different radio station um, in that shift. So it gets a bit noisy, just like you would if you're going from one station and you hit a bit of static and go to the next station. You're switching through a band of information. So I look at it that way, is that we're moving into different focus states. And right now we're in a focus state, and we call this our waking life focus state, or our, our waking cell focus state. <clears throat> when we go into the sleep state and go through this shift, we're bringing our waking consciousness into our already existing subconscious self. 
and it's the uh, subconscious mind that most people drop off their waking consciousness for and that's why they get trapped in the wildness of their subconscious so their dreams can be very wild and sometimes scary and whatnot but in that shift you'll start seeing visual patterns will start to emerge you'll start thinking in visual patterns and they can even be fractal images i don't should know if you've seen um, fractal patterns that start to emerge it can happen with meditation and that's known as a phosphine fractal and so when you start to see any kind of visual information emerging that means your mind is attuning to thinking in these higher order thought processes thinking in visual constructs thinking in sound you can start hearing faint popping sounds murmurs people talking to you whispers but these are all attributes of dreams emerging into your consciousness as your body falls asleep and it can also become tactile so you can feel vibrations in your body you can feel um, if you were to start visualizing say a stairs and a wall and sort of walking down the stairs as a focus you'd actually start to feel the wall you'd feel your feet stepping on the stairs it becomes tactile as well and so all of these sensory forms start to emerge but these now become a thought process so they are a form of thinking you're thinking now in an auditory and visual and tactile way that's pretty interesting now um in 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 paying attention to this or say you were you know trying to pay attention to this um sensory experiences or the sensory shifts would you would you focus on on thoughts or your body what are you focusing on uh, or are you just trying to relax essentially um, i try not to focus on the body any attention you put on your body will keep you awake okay. so what i do is i focus on the emerging dream and i also use when that starts to emerge and comes visual i start to program the dream and that's where you can start to create the type of dream experience that you want to have rather than going into a dream randomly you can then create and then really the limits there are your imagination so take any fantasy any desire any want and you can produce that kind of experience by shaping and programming the dream content as it forms around you interesting no super interesting i've the with in my personal experience being aware of shaping my dreams has only occurred to me or come to me after i'm aware that i'm lucid dreaming already um i've never thought of being able to you know start shape or shaping them as i am you know beginning the dreaming process but again the dreaming process is really just a language of thought between you and your subconscious mind and so your thoughts become the programming language and your subconscious mind kind of becomes the computer that renders your thoughts in that dream interface and that's just kind of a metaphor that i like to slap on it um one way i like to look at it is that nature's evolved the perfect virtual reality simulator you know it's called dreaming but all it takes is consciousness to play mm -hmm. pretty neat now that's actually it's also a very good metaphor about the earth life and something i realized with lucid dreams but before we go any further um if someone's listening to this for the first time what would they what would you describe lucid dreaming to be versus uh, what we do every night which is what i refer to as passive dreaming well right now we're in a lucid state and because we're self-aware we know we're having this experience so lucid dreaming now is taking your self-awareness into your dream state so while you're there you know that you're in that focus state and the quality of that focus state when you're conscious is much more realistic so it can be just as real as your waking life in terms of the visual it's just like another reality basically most people when they're in a dream state don't realize they're dreaming because the realism of the dream is so real they think it's reality and that's why quite often we need a reality check in a dream to break the immersion the trance like state that we're in to become conscious because remember we're talking right now about using the wild technique or waking induced lucid dreaming there's also passive lucid dreaming where you can let your body fall asleep you can turn your mind off and then you can be in the dream state and start to realize that you're dreaming and you bring yourself into lucidity by logically rationally thinking about the state that you're in yes and to pick it back on that that's actually uh the one of the techniques that i learned about by reading a book called Dream Yoga by Samuel Ann Weir it's a very short easy read book you can get the book now on Amazon and i might put a link um a description of the book below this conversation so you get your hands um 
so you get a copy in your hands. But in the book, he, he, the, the author is basically saying to lucid dream frequently, you have to self-realize all the time. And self-realizing in, in, in the author's context is becoming aware of where you are at all times, even during your waking state. And there's so many ways you could do it. Um, the author prescribes jumping, for instance, and saying, you know, every hour during the day, just take a jump. And if you're on Earth, gravity is going to pull you back to the ground. And the more you do that, the more you build this pattern in your subconscious mind that reminds you sort of like uh, automatically to take a jump every hour. And when you're sleeping, those same patterns are there. And when you begin to dream, right, you're going to have an urge to jump. And when you jump, your return to the ground is going to be different. It's not going to be um, with the effects of gravity like you have here on Earth. And when you notice that difference now, that's going to be your trigger to say, oh, wait a minute, I am not having a lucid experience on Earth. This is a different world or a dream experience. And then in that state, you can awaken um, and, and begin a lucid dream experience. He's quite correct. One of the things that I have practiced with when I came across reading it was all day awareness and mindfulness, where you start doing your dream reality checks in your waking life and doing very much a simple thing, just walking and looking at a spot and asking yourself, am I dreaming? Because we build up these patterns and these habits and they carry over into our dream state. So you can use your waking life as a template for practicing lucid dreaming and everything you do here will benefit you when you come into the art of dreaming. Indeed. I do it a lot. Yeah. I also wear uh, I wear t-shirts that say you are dreaming on them and I'll see myself in the dream wearing that shirt and right away it'll help me realize I'm dreaming. So I do little tokens here. While well, my car even says you are dreaming on the back bumper <laughs> and it's woken me up in the dream a few times. I'm sure I have a dream journal entry where I even talk about that. Indeed. So with me, what I did was instead of jumping because I thought, you know, if I walk around, I'm taking jumps every time people might think I'm crazy. But I just became really familiar with my surroundings and I was aware that I was in, you know, in my town, in my local town here in Sydney, Montana. And I also realized that I did not have very many dreams in Sydney. Most of my dreams were outside of Sydney. And so that was my trigger. If I ever was in a, a location that was in my office or house or, you know, playing basketball here locally or in the gym or something like that, that was my trigger to say, hey, something's off here you're probably lucid dreaming and then um, wake up in that set well that's the interesting thing about our subconscious mind it will create artifacts and symbols that challenge our left brain because it's the left brain that kind of shuts itself down the logical rational part of ourselves and that's the part that's really needed you kind of have to have and you get into things like binaural beats and people that talk about right brain and left brain synchronization you need to have both hemispheres working in the dream state and if you look at fmri scans of people that are lucid dreaming you'll see that they have much more activity and brain activity than a person that's a non-lucid dreamer and that's mostly noted in the prefrontal cortex where our you know our information processing our sense of self-awareness and consciousness resides so um you know for me it's like you need to be able to think and rationalize towards self-realization um it needs questioning uh, and all those weird symbols and weird settings can be triggers for your reality check. And quite often, you know, you'll know because the dream state won't be your waking state. The environment and the setting can be anything from a fantasy-based setting to another era of time or whatever kind of interest that you may have that your subconscious mind is now presenting to you as effectively a form of entertainment and saying, hey, look at this cool dream that I'm turning out for you right now. Yeah. And... Yeah, to piggyback off of that, Ian, as far as a form of entertainment, is there? Do you believe there are there is, there are more to dreams than just entertainment? Well, absolutely. I mean, I got into it for entertainment, so a lot of my dream journal entries still embody that. I love the art of dreaming because I think even right now, like we're living, breathing art. Life is is a expression of something deeper that we're a part of. Right, So I look at the universe and everything as a created process and our dreams are also another creative process. So we're always cooperating and coexisting in this creative process in sort of a form of expression. So for me, I'm really into the art of it. You know, just the, you know, you have the art of life and you have the art of dreaming and they both synchronize. 
Now, there are deeper layers, of course, in the dream state that a lot of people don't necessarily talk about. And we've already dropped um, insight into precognition or deja vu linked to past dreams. Yeah. Um, I've also had shared dreams with other people over that time. Where, Are you talking like some Inception type stuff? Some um, Inception, long before Inception the movie even came out, yeah. What? Can you tell me a little bit more about that, Ian, please? Yeah, it's a very rare thing. I am. I kind of blame it on our dream illiteracy as a species because many of us don't function in the dream states. We miss these opportunities. But so, in the rare, rare occasions where I bumped into people that I've known and were in one of those wildly abstract, symbolic dream states, um, I've been able to wake up remembering, of course, I was lucid at the time and recognize this person to end up talking to them and start saying, hey, I had a dream with you in it and start describing it to find them starting to describe the same dream back to them. Even entire conversation points, the settings, even the abstract symbolism that's supposed to be completely unique and subjective to a dream straight state, they've observed themselves. So, wow. Now that's that's well, I shouldn't say that's crazy. I think that's fascinating. I don't think it's impossible, of course, just because with my awakening, I just understand that nothing is impossible. Um, but there's one other um, individual I know who has kind of mentioned something like this, and they use binaural bits. But it's Thomas Campbell. Are you aware of Thomas Campbell? Absolutely, I love Tom's work. He's a brilliant person. For sure. Yeah. No, we'll just pick back off here. Sorry, guys. We're, we're going to pick back um, the interview here. We had a little bit of an interruption. No big deal. But we were talking about um, Thomas Campbell, and he was the he's the only other person I know who has had um, a shared, not necessarily a dream, but a shared out-of-body experience. And, and I thought that was fascinating. And then Inception, of course, introduced shared dreaming with us and then planting ideas into people's minds um, through that process. And I that that can happen. Well, it is a very fascinating process, and it's another thing that I didn't know about. These are kind of the gems that just emerge through direct experience. Had I not ever experienced a shared dream, I would never believe it possible. But once you encounter that as an experience, and especially more than one occasion, you start to realize that this isn't something rare. Well, it's rare, but this is, this is a potential that we all have. I don't think it's limited to just myself. Yeah. I was also very fortunate to be around a group of people that I worked with and I wasn't involved in their dream and there were three of them and they started describing, you know, I had a dream within it and I watched them go through the whole process of realizing that all three of them are in that same dream. Wow. So that's a big piece. So a lot of times when you're dreaming and you see familiar faces in there, it might actually be a shared dream, not just a, 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 a creation of your subconscious. Well, there's many different focus states there. And so there are some where it's entirely you and you're having your subjective experience. But as it's sort of like a structured hierarchy, as we move into these higher layers, we start dealing with things like mutual dreaming and precognition. We start seeing that there's other bands of information that we can focus on that can yield some really profound experiences from that state. Pretty neat. Yeah. Now, before we go any further, I just want to let you guys know um, I, that my new book, Who and Why You Are, is out. And in it, I think it's chapter five, I mentioned that Earth Live is an illusion. And the reason I say this, Ian, and I would love to, to hear your feedback on this, was because when I became aware of my, you know, the, the, that Earth Life was an illusion, I likened it to dreaming in that in most of our passive dreaming, we are observing ourselves in the third person. And unlike here on Earth, where when we're lucid, we, we don't observe ourselves in the third person, we're actually in the first person interacting with the world. And so waking up in the dream world lets you take over the third person you know, character that you're viewing yourself as. And that's kind of lucid dreaming, at least in my understanding. And that's kind of similar in this world that because, or well, that's kind of similar in this world in the sense that when you awaken to the truth that this world is an illusion, you become aware that there's another part of you that's actually dreaming. And I always thought, well, if you think this earth is real and your dream world is kind of the illusion and you can awaken into that world and then you kind of think about, well, this world will certainly be an illusion as well because 
right? You're, you have the capability or you can awaken in this world and realize that itself is an illusion um, and you can transform it into sort of the experience you want to have for yourself. I don't know if that made sense, but what do you think? Well, again, you're talking to someone who studied precognition. So now with lucid dreaming, I've gone past the point of just what we would call the average person's unconscious precognitive dreams. And a lot of people have that. About 35% of the population in polls have had at least one type of dream come true in their lives. Um, I've been able to bridge into that particular focus state consciously. So now take a lucid dream and that quality of your awareness and that self-awareness in that state, knowing that you're dreaming. But now this is taking place in this particular band of dreaming that I call the precognitive layer. And what you dream there in time will eventually be what you experience here. So when that dream actualizes in the future, all those attributes of self-realization that brought one to lucidity also brings over into waking life. So at the age of 17, I would have my first lucid precognitive dream. And that was a very big deal because it was the first time that I could see our waking world as the dream world, that there wasn't a separation. And now I went deeper into it and it took me eight years. So by 1998, I mustered up the courage to see what would happen. And it was a question that I had for myself. If I tried to change these dreams, what would happen if I was in a precognitive dream and I changed that dream? Would those changes happen here? And how would that effect take place? I didn't know. So I set out to try to influence and change my precognitive dream content because I observed the precognitive dream content is just another dream to me. It was just dreaming. Mm -hmm. So eventually I started having some successes where I would change the dream and it would be precognitive. And then when that dream would come true and actualize, I would observe those changes happen here. So the answer to the question was yes. You could change the dream and the changes would happen here. Pretty neat. Now, I am not familiar with precognitive dreams. So can you tell me how this is different from lucid dreaming and um, essentially how you get into that state of dreaming? Right, it's another higher band in this wonderful onion that we peel the layers back towards our experiences. And effectively what's dreamt there happens here. So it is kind of the creative process or the reality engine of this uh, universe working out um, all of our experiences because we are effectively, if you can believe it or not, dreaming right now. And that this world that we live in that we consider to be this illusionary world is in fact a persistent dream world that we're all effectively living a dream that lasts a lifetime. So, and that's a very big epiphany. A lot of people don't break through the depths of immersion that would stop one from realizing the relationship that's there. But for me, I've done this for so long and had enough of my share of lucid precognitive dreams that I sit quite comfortably in the idea that, you know, there is a covert relationship between dreams and reality because it's the same thing. It's all part of the same process. So to access precognition, that's a tough one because it's all an issue of where we're now focusing in the dream state because there's all these different layers, right? So if you can think about these different layers, where your conscious, your waking conscious is focused on will derive a type of experience from that particular band of information. So you need to try to navigate and it's towards a higher consciousness, not a lower consciousness. You'll never get there with lower consciousness, but you need to move into a more of a higher focus state. And you know, people say it's a vibrational state. For me, it's a focus state. So you're moving into a, a higher state of consciousness to now access precognitive information. But it's there for all of us. Everyone has the potential to do that, but not everybody is aspiring to do that. So they don't tend to surface up in that focus state. But you, all of us are already there. Whether we're aware of it or not, essentially. Exactly. That's pretty neat. Yeah. yeah, and it's basically like time travel. You'll see the future in your dream and it'll happen, it'll play out just like, it. for me, it got pretty, pretty intense because it was like my waking life was becoming a rerun of my dream life. So you know how when you watch a movie in the first time, you're like, oh, this is a good movie. Then you watch it the second time. It always has that feel of a rerun. Yeah. In there before you've done it. The deja vu feeling. So, yeah, that was a big part of my, I guess, my personal awakening. <laughs> That's neat. So tell me this. What, not, what have you noticed as far as a time lag between when you have a precognitive dream and then when you actually experience it here on Earth? That's, um, again, a very 
difficult gauge because it can range anywhere from um, same day, next day, three weeks, it can be months, it can be years. One of the longest ones that I've noticed was when I met my stepson before I would ever meet him, and I met him when I was conscious in that focus state, and I met him at the right age that I would meet him in my waking life, but at that time he wasn't born yet. So it would be 10 years later that I would then meet this person for the first time, but I would recognize him immediately from that 10-year-old dream experience that I had. So unlike, <laughs> so in my mind, I'm thinking instead of a past life regression, this is like a future life uh, progression that you're experiencing, essentially. Yeah, it's like moving through time with your consciousness. Sure. Yeah, huh. that's that's insane. It's pretty neat, though, and that's the, that's the beautiful thing about having these conversations with folks like you is is you mentioned this. I truly believe we are all co-creators of this experience that we're having right now with our thoughts our beliefs with our fears but then it's all a very beautifully designed and sort of um you know controlled experience where we're here just gathering a bunch of information to 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 basically use it to gather more information and generate more information and that's one way to experience consciousness is to be able to move forward through time and have a precognitive dream and then re-experience it. Now, here, here's the really big question. You know, we've been, we've been talking about all of these, which, by the way, Ian, I would like to have you back on again so that we can talk about some other um, cool dream experiences, etc. You've not even shared any of your experience. Well, you have shared that you met your um, stepson before, which is, thanks for sharing that, by the way. But I'm sure you have like you share on your website a lot of stories that you can you know, speak about in person. I think those would be a lot cooler to hear. But before we do that, here's the big question. You're doing this for entertainment. Do you think that other people can use it to actually improve their current state of um, experience here on Earth? And how Absolutely. so? Well, you know, history shows that you study the uh, different writings of different people with dreams that they've used for problem solving, invention, writing books, creating music. It's a very intense creative process that you can carry over here. Um, it can help you resolve fears. It can also straighten you out if you're in a depression. Um, it's a tool and it's a tool that can help you any point in your life kind of get rid of some of the heavy charges that we take because we're like a battery that stores these patterns. And our dreams often challenge us to these patterns so that we can release them and be free from them so we can move forward. And these things create kind of barriers in our lives. So I find, for me, lucid dreaming has helped with depression. It's helped with pretty much all my problems. I throw out my dream state, and it seems to always offer up an elegant solution to those problems, um, lessening the load of my emotional body in my life. Now, when you say throw it up to your dream state, is that part of the intention setting to say, That's okay, right. yeah, before I go to bed tonight, I have an issue with trying to solve this problem. And my intention is to find a solution with the dreams I have. That's right. And you'd be amazed how many times your dreams can give you that answer because you're not seeing it clearly while you're awake. But our subconscious mind is super powerful. It's one of the most powerful things that we have. And it can just sort all of that information out and go, by the way, here's the answer. And it does it in such a beautiful, artistic way that it can present it. And so, you know, when you're really good at something, it, you make it sound really easy. Um, and I know it takes work. So what would you tell somebody listening to say this would be a good place to start? Other than, of course, visit um, youardreaming.org or connecting with you, Ian. Um, it always starts at sleep. Um, you're already going to have four to six dreams and you're making a choice now just to participate. And as you fall asleep, it is the intention. The intention is the most important thing. That your intention to allow yourself to be conscious and start observing the shift like I did when I was younger. You wouldn't even need to read any tutorials because just by naturally observing your consciousness shifting into the dream state is sufficient to help you become conscious in it. So participate and choose to participate and once you make that choice it's just a daily practice every time you go to bed 
stand at the edge of your bed and just say, I'm allowing myself to dream. I know I'm going to dream and I want to remember them. You set up all your intentions and then you crawl in the bed and carry those intentions forward and allow the naturally occurring process to continue and this time making the choice to participate. And it really is that easy. It's just an attention focusing technique that you're applying. You're just focusing your intent and your attention on the already existing dreams that you already have. Cool. Now, Ian, again, so some, at least with me, I would, I would, I've always thought that, though I still, I currently do that, um, you know, part of your dreams are your soul guides working with you to help you solve problems, essentially. Have you found any connection with that and spirituality with your dreams? Oh, of course. I mean, the entertainment was the first part. And of course, as we've talked about, little epiphanies start to arise in that we start realizing it's not just dreaming anymore. There's a bigger reality that you're a part of that it's opening you up to. And in that larger reality, and Tom co talks about that as well, we're talking about a larger reality system that is derived by consciousness. And it's a consciousness system. <clears throat> you will encounter, now I've encountered beings of light, and I find them to be the most intriguing part of that space because they're the ones that have all the answers. They're the ones that seem to have the most direct knowledge. And um, on top of that, a lot of its role play, so a lot of the beings that you can meet there can just be archetypes of our own desires and fantasies that we've gained here that can just play out like, you know, bumping into aliens or bumping out into ghosts or um, anything. Like, I mean, Santa Claus may not be, well, I don't want to do a spoiler alert, or I will use a dragon as an example. You may not bump into a dragon here in your waking life, but you can go into the dream state and you can simulate the world's most amazingly realistic dragon. Um, that's just one way in which this art form can take on our imagination that we take for granted here and bring it to life in a way that's as real as our waking life. So you can meet all sorts of interesting archetypes and characters in that state, and some can have some good information, some can have some bad information. And, uh, you know, you'll know when it really has meaning because it usually plays out in your waking life. You'll usually get that aha epiphany where it connects to something in your waking life. They go, hey, the dream kind of had an insight on that. Yeah. Oh, that's neat. Yeah, with good, with good and bad, I always find that it's super subjective, and I leave that up to every individual to decide how the the information that they have access to or they're exposed to can either help them or not help them. That's kind of like the beauty of free will as well. Yeah, and there's there's definitely a lot of. Um, if we go really deep into this whole process of coming into the human experience, because we didn't get our start in this single lifetime, uh, what we are as, as this infinite self-awareness, um, there's a part of us, I call it the immutable self. And the immutable self is the part of us that exists between lifetimes and dreams. It's the, the one having the experience um, and just kind of props up into like the stage of life for that experience but it's the part that's the soul or the eternal you or the part of you that has always been and it's the part of you that have seen the birth and deaths of entire universes so coming into the human experience for it is very nonchalant it's not a big deal when we get here and we're now in the human experience we get caught up in the drama of the human experience and you'll read in my dream journal entries that there's also drama in the dream state so I try to tone down or control the drama so that the drama doesn't take me in a direction I don't want to go. So there's a lot of learning how to navigate your experience in the system, both in the waking world and the dream world, to be yeah. in the driver's seat. Yeah. And Ian, I want to also kind of mention this and then ask you what you think. And what I'm headed to is trying to find out if there's literally an end to how far you can take the dreaming to. That is to say, I'm currently reading a book by Michael Newton called Journey of Souls. And in it, one of the things you, um, he mentions is when you pass from this life and you return back to, you know, your soul tribe's home, while you're there, you might come across other souls that are still incarnate on Earth. And when you, you get home into your, your, your soul tribe, the way those souls respond to you is as though they are having a dream. And that dream for them is the waking life for us here on earth. Right? 
And then here, when we're sleeping, right, we can have dreams here on Earth. So that's essentially that soul having a dream within a dream. Now, have you had any experiences where you're dreaming, and then you take that further to where your dream character, either your lucid dream, is actually having another dream? And then, how far do you think that can go? And that I don't know if that gets into, you know. Fractal theory as well, but what what do you think? Well, it's a very deep rabbit hole that we tumble down. Um, I have had dreams where I can fall asleep and dream in that dream, go on to another dream, uh, and then wake up back in that dream. I can have false awakenings where I'll wake up in the same dream, thinking that I'm awake, going about my daily business, and wake up from that, realizing, oh, I was just dreaming that, and then thinking, okay, I'm awake again, and then go about my daily business, and then wake up again. And you know, so you can get into these recursive experiences. But for me, when we get into recursion, our entire experience here and there, everything is about a recursive feedback loop. And I write about that in my books: is that we are sitting in a recursive feedback loop. And what that means is, reality is a language, very complex, highly evolved and organized language that our consciousness is interpreting, and it is all feedback. So it is. Our subconscious mind in a dream state, for example, is creating the entire setting of that dream world. But they're all thoughts that are moving in recursion back to us, the observer, right? So it's kind of a loop, a feedback loop of thought. So there's all these processes in that feedback loop to create our sensation of reality. You know, we probably won't have time tonight to dive too deep into it, but we can do another talk where we start getting into, you know, um, our non-physical, non-local part of ourself that. You know, has always existed <laughs> post-human, because that'll get into a lot more of the deeper elements of this recursive feedback loop and the language of our reality as a uh, thought process or a higher-order thought process that our, you know, our deeper conscious self is heavily invested in creating. You know, creating reality, creating dream reality, creating everything will ever exist, and it's all a creative process. It, it really is. I talk about that in my book, and you kind of answered my next question: was what's the whole point of all of this? What's the whole point of having dreams, going having nightmares, being scared, being able to awaken in a dream,、um, passive dream, etc.? Well, the problem that we suffer from, and not it's not becoming human that's the problem. It's the problem that we've always existed, and so when you exist in a monolithic state with very little entertainment, it gets very dull and boring. The solution to that problem was to Evolve a informational system that allowed parts of us to become fully immersed into a deep experience, and kind of get lost in that deep experience, to then find itself again. That's beautiful, man. <laughs> that is beautiful, and and yeah, that's what I I mentioned in my book. I use different words, but essentially it's the same thing. Like we're creating an infinite array of emotions and experiences. And when we get to the end, we return to consciousness and we start it all over again. Yeah, because I mean,、yeah. you know, brace yourself for eternity and it can get very boring. It、um, can, yeah, <laughs> it can. Especially when you are all that is. I say we're all consciousness, right? And consciousness, as soon as it became self-aware that oh, I am, right? It thought, but what if I was two of me? And what if two of me became? Three of me, and what if three of me or four of me essentially became, you know, eight of me, and then one of me was creating this sort of experience, and the other one was doing this, etc. And how do I, you know, experience different aspects of myself forever and forever? And that's essentially what the cosmos is, at least to、yeah. my understanding. And you can come into that kind of an, an epiphany. I came into that as well, where I came to realize we came from oneness. And like a cell in a body, it divided into many parts, and so we are all aspects of each other. We're all aspects of this self or this I am awareness, and in, we sit in the illusion of separation. But the truth is, we are all one cosmic universal entity. That we came from this oneness, we're now in this multiplicity of itself, and we return to oneness. But the time it takes for that is so long. Think about it. It's an eternal thing. Yeah. It is pretty long, a lot longer than our lifetimes. No kidding.、Um, now, in in any of your dreams, have you found out how many times you've been here on Earth, for instance? Oh yeah, I've been able to go back to my pre-Earth entry point for sure. I've had a lot of lifetimes here. I 
came into this lifetime from a last lifetime and it was pretty highly charged because I was a soldier in the war and I got shot in the head while I was leaning over a trench and uh, from that perspective of course you know you go through the trauma of dying and having your senses shut off to a single point and then finding yourself outside of a body and then some being of light comes down and drags your sorry butt up through these layers and only to find out in the end that you're being sent back and uh, from <laughs> that past life um, I didn't want to return to the human experience but then I didn't know and of course I'm coming it from that personality so I had a lot of fear and my perception was everybody was killing everybody I didn't want anything to do with about it do about it so the being would tell me this time it would be different and it opened up this fractal portal which is the tunnel that we pass through and it kicks my butt through the tunnel and I slide down it but it when I hit that, I call it the blender because that's when it cleans the slate. And uh, of course, that personality goes through an ego death. I call it the second death. Mm -hmm. So it goes through a second death uh, where it, you know, you're getting your memories and your experiences of that last life completely stripped from you. And that's uh, not a fun process. I didn't enjoy it. And then I remember emerging from the tunnel and opening up my eyes and seeing this woman with dark hair leaning over top of me. And this is me now as a baby. And I closed my eyes, went right back through the tunnel and fought with the being and I carried on this conflict for the first five years of my waking life here so I uh, did not want to be back in this experience but eventually the immersion of being here took over at the age of five and I went on to live kind of a semi-normal kid life until the lucid dreaming started waking me back up to that again I was able to return and re-observe those experiences and have a much more mature understanding of that process so yeah I've done it all I run the whole gauntlet <laughs> That is so neat. And we haven't even mentioned this. I think I did. You're a March 15th baby, and I'm a March 14th baby. It's only right that we're talking here. And I'm not trying to be biased here, but I'm, I have a, a big affinity for, for March babies, so specifically Pisces babies. So that's a super cool story. I Again, I am not surprised because I believe in every single experience or thing, if you immerse yourself enough in it, you will find God or the creator. Essentially, I prefer not to call it God, but you will find consciousness because consciousness is everything. I mean, you could spend as much time as you have in just studying dreams and you would get the same realization. And I feel like you could spend that much time studying anything, whether it's a tree, a plant, animals, um, I, just anything that you're passionate about and you're going to end up at this same realization that we are all unique expressions of the same thing having this experience here to, to teach us all um, I guess unconditional love, acceptance that we're all one well that's what it is, I mean the thing is if your quality isn't good enough and you return or try to return to oneness, it spits you back out until yeah. your love the only way you can return back to wholeness and unity with so that evolving us towards love is a very big part of the process. And I've seen the end game. I've seen what we start out as. I've seen what we finish as. So I'm really not too worried. But I do know we go through, you know, a coal does not become a diamond without pressure. Indeed. And we're all diamonds in the rough. So when you're wondering why you're going through this intense experience with all this weight and all this emotionality and drama, it is there and this pressure is there to help you evolve. So you have to learn to step up to the challenges that your life presents to you because it really is there to evolve you. It's not there to diminish you and your experience. Um, and you will grow from it. Every experience you have, even in a dream experience, how good or bad it is, is going to help you in the bigger picture become a higher quality being. Oh, man. See, this is taking a totally different turn than I was expected, right? And... Um, but I'm loving this, and we're setting ourselves up for another conversation, Ian, and I would love to have you back, um, for sure, to talk some more. And we could take the whole um, you know, spiritual side of lucid dreaming, or the spiritual side of um, why we're here on Earth, right? I love it. I absolutely love it. Well, you can remember, you came here because you caught wind that it was quite an interesting place, and it was different. Um, I was bored and found out about this system, and... I took the dip like everybody else and got caught up in the amnesic immersion that it causes. And off you go on this roller coaster ride of lifetimes throughout history. And then suddenly, at some point, you start approaching your graduate lifetime. And I think that's kind of where I'm approaching now as graduation from the human experience seems to be on the sort of 
advisor of this lifetime because I can kind of see the end game. Here. So this may be my last sojourn here as the human wow. participant. <laughs> That's too funny because I am really hoping this is my last one too. I am not going to lie. I mean, there was one morning I was here meditating and I had beings here in my apartment playing with my legs, etc. But it ended up where I had four beings show up. They looked, you know, African-American, just like me, very big and very present. And I looked at them. They seemed very familiar. And I was like, so longing to go back and just hang out with them <laughs> and say that can you take me with you but it was not the case and i understand why we we really are here learning um, learning lessons to be basically accepting of everything that we experience and and, and learning what they what they're teaching us about well i know like i've talked with people about the whole idea because we always here in this focus state in this locality there's a lot of belief system it can really be quite difficult so you know creator and creation aren't separate and that's the first thing you need to know uh, what you do to others you do to yourself in the system and so there is a karmic law so if you're a person that is causing a lot of harm to humanity and causing a lot of chaos and hurting a lot of people um you know you can have that lifetime but the consequences of that is now you get to experience what you've done and become the victim in those roles and you know this is why you know, everything's so polarized here with like you know, racism and all this garbage and it's garbage. You know, you know, when you look at your big picture and you see all the lives that you have, you'll find that you've been many different races, male and female. Mm -hmm. So don't get caught up in the fact that today you're a male or today you're a woman. And that's the most important thing. So women have rights. No, no, it's <laughs> we really are each other. We're all aspects of this oneness, you know, and we will definitely go through more than one lifetime in this experience. So. You know, um, you pay your dues. <laughs> you oh, yeah. pay your dues. You do. Yep. It is a temporary one. Yeah, you couldn't be more accurate. And we're right um, a little short of an hour here, but I think this would be a good place to just tell folks about your free book. You have a free ebook, I believe. Yeah, I've um, the theory of precognitive dreams is pinned on my Twitter page for a free download right now on Academia. So. If you have had dreams come true and you're like, wow, where's the information on that experience? I've compiled a paper that I wrote after a dream saved my life by preventing me from getting hit by a pickup truck with my daughter in the car. It inspired that book and that was kind of my gift to humanity to say, hey, here's, here's somebody who has some experience that might have some answers. No kidding. I'll definitely be checking it out and I encourage everyone to do it. I also encourage everyone to connect with Ian and I could like I said I couldn't be more grateful that we we talked quite a little bit of interesting stuff here um stuff that might have just been over a lot of people's heads some of it was over my head because I'd never heard of precognitive dreaming I'm excited that you've uh, I don't know well you've kind of agreed <laughs> you've agreed to be back and I can't wait for our next uh, conversation but Ian Ian's on Twitter at you are dreaming he has a YouTube channel. If you search Ian Wilson Dreaming, you definitely find him. Um, and he's also um, taking care of a website, youaredreaming.org. Yours truly is on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at awake underscore RA. That's uh, Twitter and Instagram. And then on Facebook at Rowan and Chen Jang. Don't forget to join my mailing list and get... Uh, 43 page free effective meditating guide that I created for you as a gift as well because unlike Ian who remembered how amazing we all are through lucid dreaming I was lucky enough to remember this through meditating and um, my brand new book who and why you are all you need to remember is currently available on Amazon get yourself a copy when you get a chance Ian what you got to tell the folks before we wrap this up Brace yourself for eternity. <laughs> yes, that literally means time doesn't exist because um, how would you measure it if, if, you know, if it did when you're thinking of eternity? So one Ian, pattern of experience to the next. Yeah. Ian, thank you so much. I really appreciate the conversation. You're welcome. Will. It was awesome. Thanks. <laughs>